The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not even have a bucket, and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this cistern, and drank from it himself with his children and his flocks? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered and said to him, I do not have a husband. And Jesus answered her, You are right saying, I do not have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you people say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand, because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one speaking with you. At that moment, his disciples returned and were amazed that he was talking with a woman. But still no one said, what are you looking for? Or, why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I have done. Could he possibly be the Christ? They went out of the town and came to him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say in four months the harvest will be here? I tell you, look up and see the fields ripe for the harvest. The reaper is already receiving payment and gathering crops for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For here the saying is verified, that one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work, and you are sharing the fruits of their work. Many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me everything I have done. When the Samaritans came to him, they invited him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more began to believe in him because of his word. And they said to the woman, 
We no longer believe because of your word, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world, the gospel of the Lord. The gospel tells us that God is spirit. And those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. And so there's a way of worshiping God that's full of the Holy Spirit. There's a way of worshiping God that's full of life, full of love and, and that presence of God. I was on vacation for about 10 days, 11 days. I was 10, I was in Arizona, and I was in this really small town south of Tucson, not far from the border of Mexico, just a little town called Benson, small church there. And uh, uh, after Mass last Sunday, a woman comes up and says, Father Steve. And I'm like, Really? Is somebody here? knows who I am, and uh, it, she did, and she began to talk about you and our church, and when a lot of times when people talk about Holy Redeemer, they say, I love your church, and I'm like, what do you love about it? And it's like, the Holy Spirit is there, and so they can sense it in you. Uh, there is a life, there is a love, but sometimes even when we are full of the Holy Spirit already, uh, Dwight L. Moody, one of the great Protestant evangelists, when they said, do you believe in being full of the Holy Spirit? He said, yes, but I'm leaky. It keeps leaking out, <laughs> and I need to be full. Sometimes life just drains the Holy Spirit out of us, doesn't it? Sometimes it hardens us and, and makes us become uh, full of fear or doubt or sometimes just hurt. Just the hurt itself will make us unable to let the Holy Spirit just flow in us like this woman experienced. Jesus says to this woman, if you knew who was talking to you, you wouldn't be giving me a hard time. <laughs> You'd ask me and I would give you living water to drink. And that living water is the Holy Spirit. The next chapter in John, he will say, uh, to those who believe, God will give rivers of living water to flow out of the people. Is that how you experience your faith? Is it rivers of living water? Is it fire that just, just blazes in us? Most of us know. Most of us go through our spirituality and our life a little more numb than that, a little more hardened than that a little more unforgiving. And so we come to this woman at the well who, oh my goodness, life had hardened her. Uh, she went to the well at noon, at midday. No one goes to the well at midday. Everyone goes inside at midday. They take a siesta. They get out of the heat. They get out of the sun. And so they all go to the well early in the morning when it's cool. And they carry all that work back and forth. She went when no one else would be there. She went out when everyone was going in because she had five husbands and the one she was living with now wasn't her husband and all the nice people treated her especially mean. Nice people always treat people mean. Don't be nice. Be kind. Be kind in a world that needs it. Just be full of kindness. Nice people always are full of judgment, always are mean to women like this. And so what's God's response to a woman like this? God's response is, for God so loved the world that he came, he sent his son just to the woman at the well. God's response to that woman at the well is, I'll go to the well with you. I'll walk it with you. Or I'll be there waiting for you. Don't worry. Go to the well. I'll meet you there. Isn't that what Jesus really says to her? And his disciples, they're like the nice people. The disciples, when they get back and see what's going on, they're like, why is he talking to her? 
I think we should do a whole video of why is he talking to her, right? Why is he talking to this woman at the well? Why is he talking to that woman of ill repute that's pouring that ointment on his feet? If he knew who's touching him, he wouldn't do that. Why is he talking to that leper? Oh my gosh, he just touched him. Why did he touch a leper? He's unclean now. Why is he talking to and on and on throughout his whole life? And their big complaint of the nice people was he eats and visits and talks with sinners. <laughs> and that's what he came to do. God says today to all of us who have been hardened by this last year, who have become a little callous, I think sometimes our hurt leads to callousness. Just like if you rake your leaves and you get a callus on your hands, pretty soon, you know, you get these blisters first and that hurt turns into callus. And so he says to us today, I want to give you rivers of living water. I want to pour my Holy Spirit. I want to pour my mercy into you. Yesterday we had a group sitting right over here uh, and we were going to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Every one of them already was a good Christian. Every one of them was walking with Jesus and helping us in the church, but we were going to pray for them anyways because every year we can do that. We're leaky and we get hardened. And so we would just lay our hands on them and pray for them. There's no power in laying your hands. You know, Moses, uh, Moses had a staff, and God says, lead the people out of Egypt. So he's leading them out of Egypt. And what's he run into? The Red Sea. And he's looking at the Red Sea and he looks back and Pharaoh had just gotten like really mad and he sent his whole army full of rage, full of fury and all that rage and fury just blazing towards them. And Moses is like, really God? You brought us out here just to be killed by the army, is that how it's going to be? And God says, Moses, stretch out your staff over the water. And Moses is like, you're God. Why don't you just part the water yourself? Why involve me in all this? And God's like, yeah, stretch out your staff. And Moses knows he's got no power. Moses was like the most humble man alive. Uh, he, he never wanted the job. And so he stretches out his staff and the waters part. And Moses changes his tune. He like starts to look around. Did you see that? Did you see what I just did? Look at this. This is really cool. I can part waters. No, Moses can't part waters, can he? Moses can hold a staff. That's all he can do. And that's all we can do. Uh, but God parts the waters. Every one of you here can take your hand and go like this. That doesn't take anything at all, does it? And then when we do this, God does this. He parts the waters. Moses took that same staff that parted the waters and he struck the rock today. The rock was just that hardness of the people's hearts. And it said, if today you hear God's voice, harden not your hearts. So out of that rock flows water, flows living water, the Holy Spirit, uh, because the people grumbled. And it said, it said uh, at the end, the people said, is God in our midst or not they doubted didn't they they were doubting they went out there and they doubted and uh, doubt is horrible the devil always wants us to doubt you know here's how it is the devil wants us to doubt what we believe and believe what we doubt <laughs> right isn't that how it goes I, I saw that on a video uh, this week at Alpha the devil wants us to doubt what we believe and believe what we doubt God wants us to believe what we believe and doubt what we doubt. And so doubt stops that work of the Holy Spirit in us, doesn't it? Uh, fear stops that work of the Holy Spirit in us. Um, sometimes sin or unforgiveness stops that work of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, when he's dying, when he's dying on the cross, he looks down and, and he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. He shows us how to do it. 
And so we were praying for these people to receive the Holy Spirit. And I was right here praying for some people. And Paul was with me. And, and we were praying. And, and that we would say, what was the Holy Spirit doing in you while we were praying? How did you experience the Holy Spirit? And the and first person said, I was, I was all of a sudden full of joy. Yeah, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Another person said, I was completely set free. Completely just free of all that fear. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Another woman said, I was in like this perfect peace. It was like I was in that peace of God. And so that Holy Spirit was coming into the life. One woman said, I was like a little child in God's arms. And I'm like, yeah, I've experienced all those things in the Holy Spirit. That's what this week is for. This week is for all of us to come to God. I wish we could pray over everyone here because the Holy Spirit can refresh our souls, our spirits. But like the video said, the Holy Spirit can refresh our whole church, can it? Our whole church can have that refreshing of the Holy Spirit. When people say, when I go to Holy Redeemer, I feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we need to do that work every year because all churches can get hardened or unforgiving too. And so we need that renewing of the Holy Spirit where we say, yeah, we feel the freedom of God here. We feel the true peace. We feel totally in God's arms, just, just trusting and joyful in God's arms. So I was reading this book by Raniero Cantalamesa. Father Cantalamesa is the preacher to the papal household. And he was talking about the Holy Spirit. And he was talking about the woman at the well. And he was talking about liturgies like this that we have. And he says, you know, it can just be a liturgy, which is cold and hard for us, and we just stay mean, we just stay hard, we just stay unforgiving. Or with the Holy Spirit, our liturgies can become alive. They can become full of the Holy Spirit. Our liturgies can be full of rivers of living water and this blazing fire. And so he said, in your prayer... He said, there's two things that happen, and that they're just words. So one was juxtaposition, and one was subordination. Let me tell you what I meant. Juxtaposition. He says, it's when you pray, and then you go do some good work. So there's action and prayer. And action is whatever is not in the prayer. And so we like to pray and be alone with God. Then we like to go out and feed the hungry or work in outreach or go volunteer in our schools or go do some good work out there. He said, that's good, prayer and action, but that's juxtaposition. We want to evolve to be spirit-filled. We want to come over to subordination. And what he meant by that is when we pray, listen to God and let our action be what we heard God say in prayer. And Jesus says today, he says, I have food you don't know of. My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. And so when we pray full of the Holy Spirit, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, God speaks to us and says things like, go uh, tell your wife you're sorry or that you love her or go do something for your kids or go volunteer in the church, or go work to help the poor. Uh, begin tithing, begin doing these good things. And so that's subordination. In prayer, we listen to God. He tells us what to do, and then we do that. That's our action. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Instead of just having prayer and action, we have action that comes out of our prayer because we're full of the Holy Spirit. This is the faith that we experience with the woman at the well. Jesus promised her the Holy Spirit in her life. Jesus promises you in this week of Lent the Holy Spirit in your hearts, in your souls, in our parish, in our whole life. So let's, let's just pray right now. Let's just say, come Holy Spirit. Let's sing that song, Veni, Sancte. Spiritus. And let's just say, Lord, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and our church. Veni sancti.